Happy afternoon, everybody. Uh, we are we need to get right into this today because uh, today we have a very full lecture day. So we're gonna we're gonna use probably the whole time that we've got here for that. We don't do that very often, but we will today. Um, today we have a combination of some review stuff that uh, hopefully you remember a little bit about some of the things that we do today from uh, Engineering 122. But for some of the things that we cover today, it will look a little bit new. Okay, so uh, that's what we have, on, you know, in store for today. So uh, let's start by just trying to remember what we mean by moments and torques. Okay, and so to help us with that, I've got a, a few little points that I'll make up here. The idea of moments and torques is that it is a measure of a magnitude of a tendency to cause rotation. Okay, so that's kind of the big idea of what you're trying to measure whenever you try to, you know, evaluate a moment or a torque. Okay, and I've got it listed up here. the uh, The way that we evaluate this, kind of the basic definition of it, is you take a certain magnitude of force. So we could kind of show that on an example of, let's say, a lug wrench on a uh, on a lug nut. So you take a magnitude of force, and then you figure out how far the line of action is of that force away from the point that you are evaluating the moments around. Okay, So you would basically look at a distance that would be uh, from that line of action to that point such that that distance was measured perpendicularly to the line of action of the force. Okay. So you guys probably remember that, um, but uh, you know I'll, I'll say that that's what it is, right? So we got the force, and then a lot of times we'll call this a length or a distance. You take the, the product of those two values, and that measures this tendency to try to cause rotation. It's an influence that tries to cause rotation. All right. Um, so that's you know that's how we've defined it in the past. A couple of extra points about this. Um, you may have heard the word moment and you may have heard the word torque and uh, you might be confused about when we should use one of those terms versus the other. So let me clear that up just a little bit. Technically, those are the same. They're two different words for the same thing. Okay, Tendency to cause rotation. We can refer to that as a moment or we can refer to that as a torque. Uh, actually, a lot of times if you look in things like physics textbooks, they're probably going to refer to these as torques relatively exclusively, whereas when you talk to engineers, they will often refer to these as moments in certain cases. Okay, So here's how engineers tend to break this up, although, again, I'm going to say it's not really wrong to say it either of the ways, but usually what is done sort of in practice is that when you're talking about a moment, you're usually referring to some tendency to cause rotation that is caused by something like a load in a transverse orientation to the axis of the thing that you're looking at. So the example I would give there is actually that lug wrench that we have uh, in this example, right? You're putting this force on that is transverse, meaning perpendicular to the axis of the member that you're applying it to. And we frequently refer to those types of scenarios and, and the tendency that, that uh, there is to cause rotation will refer to that as a moment in that type of a scenario. Whereas, uh, sometimes when we're talking about this type of thing, we might be looking at something more like a shaft. Okay, So maybe I'll this is think of like a long slender member like this, where you would have some tendency to try to cause rotation here and maybe a reaction against it at the other end. In these type of scenarios, often the word that we use is torque instead of moment. Okay. So, but the thing I want you to realize is that neither one is necessarily wrong. There's just sort of a common usage that's out there so that you don't get confused if we use one term versus the other. Okay? So that is what we're doing with all of these questions is figuring out what is this magnitude of a tendency to cause rotation about a particular point, if you're talking about 2D, or about an axis a lot of times if you're talking about 3D. Okay? So that's where we're going with all of these questions. So let's start in with an example. Okay, 
And you immediately notice that this example that we're about to work, the line of action of that force is not already perpendicular to the length along which we know the length, right? The kind of the distance or the, uh, the line along which we know the length of 14 inches there. And you probably remember there were a couple of ways that we had to deal with this whenever we learned this back in 122, okay? Um, the way that probably jives the best with the other things that you learned is a method where you split your force into components. Anyone remember that? Okay. So let's actually work this problem where we think about doing it that way. And we split the force of 120 pounds into components and the length of 14 inches into components. Before I actually get into that, though, let's actually think about why is that a helpful thing to do? Why is it helpful to think about splitting the 120 pound force into X component and Y component and then split that 14 inch length into X component and Y component? Why is that helpful? Okay, they will naturally be, like the, one of the force components will naturally be perpendicular to one of the length components. And then one, the other of the force components is going to be perpendicular naturally to the other length component. And it makes it to where we can just add those two effects together and end up with a moment. So let's go ahead and, and do that for this case. So how do we start? OK. Sounds like you want to take, right, you want to take the force and split it into x and y components. So let me draw those up here. Let's say. You know, there's my uh, X component there, and then I have a Y component that might act right here. And you're saying that the X component down here would have a magnitude of 120 pounds times what? Cosine, Cosine of 80 degrees. Right? And the magnitude of the vertical component would be 120 pounds times the sine of 80 degrees. Simple enough, right? OK, now what do we do about the lengths? OK, we have a 25 degree angle from horizontal up to this line along which, you know, that it, I guess I should say that is measured from the point that we're evaluating the moment around to the point where the force is being applied, right? And I think what I hear you guys saying is that we can take and basically draw a triangle right there. And by drawing that triangle, it really illustrates for us these two lengths. So like this length along the bottom down here, what is that? What would that be given what we know? 14 inches times, OK, I hear people saying cosine. And how do you know it's cosine? OK, cosine of 25 degrees, it's because that is the adjacent side to where that angle is measured. And the cosine always goes with the adjacent uh, side. OK, and this vertical part right here is 14 inches times the sine of 25 degrees. OK. We good so far? Well, now what do we do? OK. We got to multiply uh, a perpendicular component of force and length you know, for one, one pair, and then another perpendicular component of force and length, and then add those two together. So which one do you want to start with? OK. So we're going to take this moment. You're saying, I think the, you want the x component of force first. All right. So 120 pounds times the cosine of 80 degrees times what? Times 14 inches times, OK, now do we want 14 inches cosine of 25 or 14 inches sine 25? Right, we want the one that's the sine of 25 degrees because 
we look at that line of action of the 120 pound force and we want the component of length that's perpendicular to that. And that's that component of length is of 14 inches times the sine of 25 degrees. Okay, now before I move any further, make sure you understand that there is a directionality to this tendency to cause rotation. And when you start evaluating these, you need to decide beforehand what direction you want to be positive as you evaluate these sums or else you might end up uh, you know, counting two things that actually act in opposite directions, you might count them as acting in the same direction. Okay? So what direction would you like to choose as positive as we write these terms? A lot of you are very familiar with uh, making counterclockwise positive. So we will do that here, make counterclockwise positive, in which case that term that I just wrote, is that correct? Does that 120 pound cosine of 80 degrees tend to cause a counterclockwise rotation around the nut or a clockwise? Let's look at it really carefully. Okay, so what we have is we have a leftward force that is located above the nut, right? So I'll turn myself around here. And uh, so we're pushing leftward at a location that's above this point, and you see that will cause the body to start rotating counterclockwise. Okay? So given that, we have the correct sign for our first term. Okay? Now what about the second term? Should I make it positive or negative? Okay? Here are a bunch of people saying negative because, in this case, right, it's uh, the location is to the right of the nut and I'm pushing with a downward uh, force there and that's going to tend to try to rotate it clockwise. So I'm going to count that as a negative value, negative 120 pounds times, okay, I want just the vertical component so I'd, I'd multiply by that sine of 80 degrees, but then what do I have to multiply that by? Right, because I look at that line of action and I say the perpendicular length to that line of action is the 14 inches times the cosine of 25 degrees. Okay, and so I think that's about all that we have to write because we've now evaluated both components of force acting on the handle of this wrench. So let's punch them in, okay? All right, we've got 120 times the cosine of 80. Make sure you're in the right uh, angle mode, right? It's always a good thing to check. Times 14 times the sine uh, 25, and then we'll say minus 120 times the sine of 80, okay, times 14 times the cosine of 25. Okay. And this ends up giving me a negative 1,376.2. What are the units? Okay, inch pounds. Okay, so let's interpret that negative sign there. What does that negative sign mean? Okay. I assumed counterclockwise was positive when I did this sum. Added them up, got a negative number. So the negative sign means the actual result is not the direction you assumed was positive. It's the opposite of that. So it's a clockwise uh, moment. Okay. So sometimes what people will do is they will make a separate step and they will say, 
1376.2 inch pounds clockwise. Okay. All right. Now what I want to do with this next is show you something that, that I think is pretty cool that makes this, it can make it a little bit easier. Okay. And it involves using vectors. All right. So uh, another way to define a moment, like the moment created by a force, is using vectors. And the definition is that the moment, which is a vector quantity, is equal to an R vector crossed into a force vector. Okay? Now this takes a little bit of definition here. Okay? First of all, let's think about what a moment vector is. Okay? A moment vector, you can view it as an actual arrow on a real body, right? But the way it works is whatever direction the arrow is pointing, it means that it causes a uh, rotation according to the right-hand rule where you point your thumb in the direction of that arrow. Okay? So if, this, if I have an arrow that's pointing this direction, I point my thumb in the direction of that arrow, and it means that this arrow implies a tendency to try to make it rotate the direction that my fingers will curl around that arrow, right? As long as I'm using my right hand, make sure you don't try to do right hand rule with your left hand, right? Use your right hand, point your thumb in the direction of the arrow. The direction that means the thing is going to try to rotate is, uh, you know, the direction that your fingers will, will curl once you curl them around that arrow. Okay, we comfortable with that so far? If I had an arrow that pointed the other way, I'd point my thumb that direction, and the direction that my fingers curled would be the rotational direction implied by that arrow. Okay? So when we talk about a moment vector, that's what we mean. We say we look at the direction the arrow is pointing, and we can interpret that by pointing our thumb in that same direction and looking at the direction that our fingers curl of a right hand. Okay? So that's what the moment vector means. The R vector is a vector that is drawn such that the tail of the vector is located at the location you're trying to evaluate your moment around, right? In other words, in this case, it's going to be the nut, because we're trying to evaluate what is this tendency to rotate around the nut, right? So you put the tail of the R vector where you're trying to evaluate the tendency to rotate around, and then you extend the head of the vector out to the location where the force is being applied. Okay? So that right there, for my case right here, is, an, is the R vector. All right? I'm going to put that a little bit different spot so I can put the... That is my R vector. Okay? Now the force vector is probably the easiest one to understand. All right? We sort of already understand a force vector. And we see it up there. It's that 120-pound uh, force up there. OK? Um, so now, here's what we need to do. We need to look at our R vector and our F vector and express what the components are of the R vector and the F vector. OK? Nice thing is, we've already basically done it for the F vector. So why don't I go ahead and write those down? What are the components of the F vector? Fx is going to be what? Okay, the magnitude is going to be 120 cosine of 80 degrees. 120 pounds times the cosine of 80 degrees. And I said that carefully, right? When we do these for, the, for use in a cross product, we need to make sure that we uh, evaluate them so that we match our coordinate system that we chose. Okay, so if I chose a rightward x, which I did on this figure, and my uh, x component of my force points to the left, what do I need to do for the sine? Okay, should be negative because it's opposite what I defined as positive. Okay, what about f y? Uh, 
okay? It's also going to be negative 120 pounds, but this time times the sine of 80 degrees. And again, that's because I defined positive upward for my y, and uh, I've got a downward arrow for that uh, component. So, so those are relatively easy. Now, what do I do for my r vector? Okay, I really have those defined as well because if you look at the r vector that I that I've shown right there, it is going to be the sum of an r x, right? A vector that I show right here, r x. A vector sum of that and a vector that I show pointing up like this, r y. So what is r x? Fourteen inches times the cosine of twenty-five degrees. Okay. What is R Y? Fourteen inches times the sine of twenty-five degrees. Okay. And should both of those be positive? Yeah, because both of them point the direction that I defined my positive directions. Okay. All right. Well, now we have to actually get into what do you do to evaluate a cross product. Okay. And there's a few different ways that are out there that you might even remember. Um, but let me show you the way I tend to try to remember a cross product. Here's how I do it. First of all, I'm going to use a vector notation where we have unit vectors that point in my three coordinate directions. Okay? I'm going to define a vector of length 1. I'll use a different color here. Okay? I'm going to define a vector of length 1 pointing in the x as being i. But I'm going to call it i hat. I'm going to put this little hat on top of it. It is a vector of length 1 that points in the x direction. Okay? What do you think I'm going to do in the y? j hat, right? So that's a vector of length 1. Again, this is a little tricky because it's not actually a vector of length 1 inch, right? It's a vector of length 1. Okay? So there it is, x and y. And then the one that will be hard for me to draw is a vector that's pointing straight at us out of the page. And we're going to call that k hat. Okay? So I'm going to define these unit vectors. And then once I define them, one way to remember a cross product okay, is to uh, list out in a first row of a determinant i, j, and k. Some of you might be looking at me and say, I've never seen a determinant. How many of you would say that? Okay. If you haven't, it's not that big a deal. But, you know, it's a, it's a piece of linear algebra that maybe or maybe you haven't seen. I don't know. Okay. So in the first row, you list out i, j, k. In the second row, we're going to list out the x, y, and z components of our r vector. Okay, So for the x component, I'm going to list out 14 inches times the cosine of 25 degrees. For the j component, I'm going to put in 14 inches times the sine of 25 degrees. And what should I put for my k component for my r vector? Zero. OK. Now, in the third row, I'm going to list out my components of my force vector. So my x component of my force vector is what? 120 cosine 80 degrees. And here I've got minus 120 pounds times the sine of 80 degrees. And what about my x component for my force vector? Zero. 
zero. Okay, and when you do a determinant, the symbol for that is you just put vertical lines on either side of that matrix. Okay. And some of you might remember how to do a determinant of a three by three, or if you don't, let me show you because it's, it's relatively simple. What you do is you take the first two columns of the three by three matrix. So I'm going to take these two columns right here and you copy them over here to the right. Okay. And that sets you up to be able to do a pattern of computation. And here's that pattern of computation. You take I times 14 inches sine 25 degrees times zero. And you add to that J times zero times negative 120 pounds cosine of 80 degrees. And you add to that K times 14 inches cosine of 25 degrees times 100, negative 120 pounds sine 80 degrees. Okay, you add up products of each of those three diagonals. This is just, you know, uh, the definition basically of the cross or of the uh, of a determinant of a three by three, and it turns out that a cross product is just the determinant of a three by three constructed in this way. Okay. All right. Then what you do is you subtract a diagonal that goes this way, J times 14 inches cosine 25 degrees times zero minus I times zero times negative 120 pounds times sine of 80 degrees minus K times 14 inches sine 25 degrees times negative 120 pounds cosine of 80 degrees. Okay, and this works even if we don't have zero components that you'll notice, you know, for this particular example, we have these zero components right here, and that'll make when we com compute this particular one way easier, right? The fact that we have zeros right there makes it way easier, but even if there weren't zeros there, this method would still work, okay? All right, so now what is ultimately our moment vector? Any thoughts? Okay. So the, uh, the first two diagonals that I have right here for I and J have zeros in them, right? So it's the third one, this third diagonal, that doesn't have a zero in it. So I'll end up with K times 14 inches cosine 25 degrees. Okay. K times 14 inches. Uh, times the cosine 25 degrees, okay, times what? Negative 120 pounds times the sine 80 degrees, okay? And then if I go back across my blue diagonals, okay, the, the furthest right one has a zero in it. And then the one that starts with I right here has a zero in it. And then we get to the one that's furthest to the left. It does not have a zero. And remember, I'm subtracting those. So I basically subtract K, uh, K, yeah, K hat times 14 inches sine 25 degrees, okay, times a minus 120 pounds times the cosine 80 degrees. All right, so we've now got this, uh, these two products that aren't zero that are up here, and what we're going to do is compare those with this expression. How do they compare? 
Okay. So notice here that this sign right here will cancel this sign. So basically, I have a positive 120 cosine of 80 times 14 inch sine of 25, just like I have for my first term up here. The second term, um, I don't have anything to cancel the negative. So I have a negative 120 pound sine of 80 degrees times 14 inches times cosine of 25. That's just like the second term in my equation or my, my expression that I evaluated earlier. OK? So this is actually interesting. Um, I'm showing you, for at least for 2D, why it is that the cross product works to find a moment. Right? That's actually kind of what the meaning of the cross product is. OK? So we can conclude that this ends up being, OK? Um, we can essentially factor out the K, so I won't necessarily do it, but let me, let me, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll guess I'll express it like this. It'll be negative 1376.2 inch pounds K. And so what does that mean? Okay, I opened with what does it mean to have a moment vector? Now we have a moment vector, negative 1376.2 inch pounds k, right? So what do we do to interpret that physically? Okay, what we'll do is we'll say, well, it's a negative value. So one way of, of dealing with that is you say, instead of pointing my thumb along the positive direction of k, I'm going to point my thumb along the negative direction of k and then look at the direction that my fingers roll of my right hand, OK? So remember, k is pointing out straight at us out of this page. So if I was going to, you know, if I was going to deal with this, I would basically put my hand up here and point my thumb uh, on the positive z if I had a positive quantity. It'd be pointing out this way, but I don't have that, so instead I'll point my finger or my thumb of my right hand into the board and look at the direction that my fingers roll. That is clockwise, right? And so that also jibes with our previous method of doing it. Okay? Now, I would like to make your life a little bit easier now. Would you like me to do that? OK. This is a pretty slick piece of equipment right here. And it's allowed on your tests. OK. Let me show you how you can put vectors into this calculator and do cross products. OK. So the first thing I'll show you is that above the 5 key right here, there is a word that says vector. So we're going to get this thing into vector mode. Oh, I think, there we go, eight. We'll get to that in just a second. The, the vector menu, I think, is what the five gives you. Anyway, uh, to get to vector mode, I actually hit mode, right? And then there was an option there that said vector. Now, it doesn't necessarily give you a lot of help. So that's why I'm going to talk you through what to do. So basically, inside of vector mode, there are three containers available where you can load vectors. Right? They're called vector A, vector B, and vector C. Okay? So when it says vector, right, you have an option of choosing which vector you would like to load data into. Right? So let's go ahead and just pick A. The next question it asks you is what size of a vector would you like to build? Okay? Even if you're doing a 2D problem, you need to still pick three. Okay, So we're going to hit the option one there, which is a three element vector. And what we're going to do is load in our R vector information, 14 times the cosine of 25. For the first term, 14 times the sine of 25 for the second term, 0 for the last term. Now, the next keystroke I do is the least intuitive keystroke you will make. 
while you are doing this. Okay. The next keystroke I'm going to hit is AC. Why does that feel unintuitive? Why doesn't that feel good? It feels like you're about to clear what you just entered, but you're not. Okay. All you're doing when you hit AC, at least when you're in this mode, is it gets you out of data entry mode for that vector. It stored what you put in there. Now you're back to the plain uh, screen in vector mode. And the next thing you need to do is actually hit Shift-5. And it brings up the vector menu again, or so a few options in this vector mode. And so the next thing we're going to do is define the B vector. Right? So to do that, I'll hit 4. Actually, excuse me. I always misspeak at this point, so I apologize. That's not what we want to do. If I pick vector B, if I pick option 4 here, it's going to call vector B for me to use. That's not what I want to do. I want to load more information into vectors first before I do that. And it always slips my mind what the proper uh, keystrokes are. But basically, I need to pick option 2 so that I can put the data in for my next vector. So I'm going to hit 2 and put in for vector B, select vector B there, a three element vector and put in my, my information for my force vector. Okay, so there I've got negative 120 times cosine of 80 degrees. Okay, here I'm going to put in uh, a negative 120 times the sine of 80 degrees. Zero for the last entry. What do you think I do now? AC. Now, to do my cross product, the cool thing is the cross product command is actually just the times key. Right? So all I have to do is get it, get my vector A and my vector B up there with the times in between it, and it'll give me the uh, essentially the vector product of those two terms. So to get that, remember we go back to this vector menu. I'm going to take vector A times vector B and hit equals. It gives me this result that says I have 0 for my x component, 0 for my y component, and negative 1376.2 or so for my z component. Exactly what I did by doing it manually. Okay. And that uh, makes it pretty smooth to get that cross product. OK? Any questions at this point? Yes, the, com the question was, do I know what the command is for a dot product? And I'll show you where you can find that. If you go back to the vector menu there, you'll notice that option 7 says dot. So if you need a dot product, it'll do that as well. Okay. Cool. Now, let's get into our, uh, our next problem for which this information will be very handy. Okay. What if we extend this? Oh, actually, put that on hold for just a second. I forgot I was going to do this with you real quick before I go to the next thing. Let me show you this alternative method of doing this same problem. Okay. Um, the alternative method is to think of it in more geometric terms. Right? So if you think of this problem more geometrically, what you could say is, what if I took that 120 pound force and instead of splitting it into x and y components, what if I split it into components where 1 was parallel with the handle of the wrench, and the other one is perpendicular to the handle of the wrench. OK? So why would I think of doing that? OK? Yeah, what I've done is I've set something up so that one of these components has a line of action that passes through the point that I'm trying to evaluate the moments around. <coughs> 
what effect is that component going to have as far as a tendency to cause rotation? No tendency to cause rotation. There's no tendency at all because its line of action passes through the nut. What about the one that's perpendicular? Okay. The one that's perpendicular is now set up so that we know the length from that line of action of that force perpendicularly to the point we're trying to find the moments around. Okay? So if I can determine what that component of force is right there that goes perpendicular to the handle of the wrench, then uh, all I have to do is multiply it by 14 inches and I've got the moment. Okay? So how do I do that? Okay. Well, basically, that's, that's how I drew it, right? He says, do you rotate your axis of application by 80 degrees? You know, that's actually what I did there is I rotated my axes by 25 degrees, right? So that I lined them up with the direction of the handle of the wrench. And that is kind of the entry point to understanding this is to say, since I rotated them like that, what is this angle, even though I may not have it drawn perfectly to scale? What will that angle be? Okay, this is a 25 degree angle, right? Because you can see, you know, we have basically two parallel lines, this horizontal line and the x-axis, and then I've got a, a line moving through those, and so those two angles that I've identified right there should be congruent. Okay, well if I have 80 degrees minus 25 degrees, then what would this angle right here be? Okay, 80 minus 25 would be 55. Okay, so yeah, I know it doesn't look like it's horribly to scale, but at least we get the idea. Well, once I know that's 55 degrees, then how do I determine what this magnitude of force is over there? 120 pounds, okay, times the cosine Cosine or sine? Sine of 55 degrees. Okay. So if I'm figuring out the moment from here, I say it's going to be, and let's say I take counterclockwise positive again, what effect is that component of force going to produce if I'm taking counterclockwise to be positive? Negative. negative, right? It's the opposite of that direction. So I'll put in here negative, and then I'll punch that in a calculator, right? Well, actually, I'll tell you what, I'll, uh, I'll write it out here. So minus 120 pounds times the sine of 55 degrees times 14 inches. Okay, so in my calculator, I got to get back into plain uh, computation mode. So here I'll do minus 120 times the sine of 55 times 14, minus 1376.2 inch pounds. Okay, so just wanted to give that to you. Occasionally you might encounter a problem where it might end up being a little easier to do it this way than trying to split it into components or do cross products or any of that kind of stuff. Okay, finished with my, uh, my alternative method here. Back to this other idea of I just taught you how to do a cross product in your calculator and that becomes a very useful skill for you to have when we move this problem into three dimensions. Okay. I want to find the components of moment and the resultant moment that the 400 Newton force produces about point A. Okay. Okay. 
So how do we do this? Okay, we figure out force vector and R vector. So first of all, how would I, if I was going to draw this R vector, where would I draw it from and to? From A. From A. And in 3D, I, you know, it's always kind of tricky to draw it in 3D, but it's tail of the vector should be at A. Head of the vector should be at, B, at D, excuse me. Okay. You might notice here there's something I have not put on this diagram yet. What? Axes. Why? Because that's, that's your job as an engineer that's analyzing this thing to figure out what axes you would like to use. Okay? Given how it's drawn and kind of how it's implied, how the pipe um, is built, as well as you know, where the wrench is at, what do you think an obvious way would be to set up these axes? Okay. Let's say the wrench is perpendicular to, um, you know, length BC, and length BC is perpendicular to length AB, and uh, you know, so everything's nice and perpendicular. If that's true, then what would be the obvious way to set up our axes? Okay. We probably should set them up so that one of them points in the direction of pipe AB. Okay. Another one might be good to point in the direction parallel with segment BC. And a third one might be good to set up parallel with the handle of the wrench. Okay. Now, I do need to mention this, too. Whenever you set up your x, y, and z coordinates, there is such thing as a right-handed coordinate system versus a left-handed coordinate system. Okay? And the way you know whether or not you have a right-handed or left-handed coordinate system is like this. If you take you like your, you know, from x to y and your thumb points in the z, okay? And then you take uh, from y to z, right? Curl your fingers from y to z and your thumb points in the x. And then the last direction to think about would be what if you curl your fingers from z to x and your thumb points in the y? Then that means you have a right-handed coordinate system. So there's something significant about that sequence. Basically, x, y, z, x. If you have that sequence, then you have a right-handed coordinate system. Okay. So I'm not going to get too big into that, but because I'm, I'm typically going to always give you uh, a right-handed coordinate system if I give it to you. But I do want you to realize it is possible for you to, to write a coordinate system that is not a right-handed coordinate system. And I don't recommend it because it messes with your presumptions that you have for your cross product. Okay. So try to make sure your coordinate systems are right-handed if you are the one establishing them. Okay. Um, I'll give you a hint. It should always be something that you can construct alternatively so that if you have a plain XY coordinate system like this, where should the Z be pointing? Straight out of the page at you, right? So not into the page, out of the page. All right. All right. Well, that was an interesting sidebar. But now we've got our coordinate system set up. And what do we need to do? Someone mentioned it earlier. We probably should go about finding the R vector. So what is this R vector? Okay. Yeah, someone says this one should be 30 centimeters. And then to use our notation, I'll say 30 centimeters I plus what? Okay. 50 centimeters J hat. Okay, someone says minus 15 centimeters K hat. Why were the first two positive and the last one negative? 
Yeah, I've defined upward to be positive for the z and to go from the tail to the head of the r vector, the r vector being this thing right here, I have to change downward in the z so that I should count that one as a negative. All right, good. That's our r vector. What's the uh, f vector? Oh. 400 newtons. How do I pick off just the x component? Okay. I'm going to need to do okay, 2 over what? Okay. 5 squared plus 2 squared plus 1 squared. Okay, and what component is this? X component, which we denote with uh, unit vector notation as I hat. Okay, and do I have my sign correct? Okay, I do, because going from the tail of that vector to the head of the vector, I change in the positive X going from the tail to the head. Okay, what about my next component, my y? Okay, and then I use j to indicate the y direction, right, j hat. And do I have my sign correct? Should it be positive or negative? Okay, and then lastly, okay, yeah, negative 400 newtons, right, minus 400 newtons because going from the tail to the head, I have to go downward. Okay, and I use 1 over square root of 5 squared plus 2 squared plus 1 squared. Okay, okay, right? <laughs> what do we do to actually evaluate the moment around A? Okay, cross product. How do I do a cross product? Yeah, why don't I co go in here and go back to my vector mode? And for vector A, what should I put in? 30, 50, I'm putting in my r vector right now, and negative 15. Okay, what do I do at this point? AC. Next step is to, if you hit shift and right above the 5 key, it says vector, right? It takes you into this menu. You don't make the mistake I almost made a few minutes ago and try to pick vector B just yet because what you want to do is load data into vector B, so you pick option 2 there. The second option in that menu is vector B, and now we're going to load data into that three-element vector. So the first one will be 400 times 2 divided by the square root of 5 squared plus 2 squared plus 1 squared Okay, the next one will be 400 times 5 divided by the square root of 5 squared plus 2 squared plus 1 squared. And then the last one I'll have negative 400 times 1 over the square root of 5 squared plus 2 squared plus 1 squared. Okay, keystroke at this point, AC again, go back into our vector menu, which is above the 5 key right there. I'm going to pick out a vector A and cross it into a vector B. Now this is interesting. 
least I think so. Okay. What's the first term? 1825.7. Okay, so here's my moment vector. Point seven. What are my, my units? Newton centimeters, which I know you don't like that, but that's my units, right? Newton centimeters. And what else should I put to really make this a vector? I hat, right? Because it's the first element in that little vector that it was showing me. Okay? I'm going to hit equals again. Oop, not equals again. Right arrow. And I look. It ends up being a zero. I actually just randomly picked these values and I didn't necessarily mean for that one to come out zero, but it did. Okay? So I could say plus if I want. Zero what? J. And then lastly, 3651.5 Newton centimeters. K. So let's think about how do we actually interpret these suckers. Start with I. What does that really mean? Okay. So I went I'll go all the way back to the beginning. The the meaning of a moment vector, you take your thumb and you point it the, the direction the arrow is pointing. So what direction is the I vector pointing? In the X, right? It's a positive value, so I put my thumb in that positive x direction. What that means is that that term is a tendency to rotate around the x-axis such that it basically brings the pipe sort of like it would swing upward, right? It basically is going to be going this direction around that x-axis. Because if you point your thumb in the positive x, that's the direction your fingers will curl if you use your right hand. Okay? Does that make sense? Is that what you would expect to happen? Okay. You think so? We'll see in just a second. Okay. All right, so the, around the K, it does end up being a bigger number, right? And what direction do we expect it to go? Okay, it's a positive number. Stick your thumb in the positive Z direction. Your right hand, your fingers will, will curl this direction. All right? Does that make sense? Okay. Well, let me show you one last little thing before we leave this point. Let's pick one of those and figure out how would we figure out the um, how would we figure out the moment if we didn't have this sweet cross product method, right? Where we can just punch it right in our calculator. What would we do if we had to do this manually? Okay. Same type of thing, right? We need to determine what are all the effects that would cause a rotation around a particular axis. Which axis do you want to do? Because I don't want to do them all. Let's do one of them. Z? OK. So let's think of the components of the force that would cause a rotational tendency around the Z axis. OK. Certainly, I think most of you would look at the Y component. And you would say, that Y component looks like it, it would act along a line that would be like over here. And then when you look at the axis over here, there's a perpendicular distance between those axes, right? And you would say that would tend to cause a rotation around the z axis, right? And how would we figure that out? Okay, we would have 
All right, we would have uh, 400 newtons times 5 over the square root, 5 squared plus 2 squared plus 1 squared. Okay. Next question I've got, is that the only thing that would tend to cause a rotational effect around the z-axis? Actually, I need to multiply this by a length, right, before I move to that point. What, what length should I multiply this by? Would be this length right here. What is that length? 30 centimeters, right? Because it's, you know, that axis is parallel with the yz plane, right? So it would be 30 centimeters. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm picking off one. The question was, can I explain why I chose the j-hat component of force to talk about the, the uh, rotational effect around z? The reason I picked that one first is it, it seems to me that it's that component that has the largest amount of force where that component's line of action doesn't pass through the, uh, the axis, right? So because it doesn't pass through and it's got this distance relative to it, then we can determine a, uh, a moment. And since it looks like the biggest one, that's why I chose it first. But there's another component as well that might cause a rotational effect around Z. Can you think of what it is? Okay, someone said X. Whoever said that, good job. Okay, the X component of the force also creates a rotational tendency around Z because its line of action is over here. Right, that's the line of action of the, the uh, X component of force and that line has a distance relative to the z-axis. What is that distance? 50 centimeters. Okay, 50 centimeters. Wonderful. So we basically say we're going to have 400 newtons to get just that uh, x component. I'm going to multiply by 2 over the square root of 5 squared plus 2 squared plus 1 squared, okay? Now the next question is, does that tend to try to rotate it in the positive direction by the right-hand rule or the negative, okay? So let me, to really figure that out, let me actually draw a little arrow that's the direction that that little x component of force would be acting. That little force that I show right there, is it going to tend to try to rotate it so that, you know, it swings the, the rod around the direction that I showed this arrow or opposite? While you're thinking, I'm going to put the 50 centimeters over here. Okay. Someone says clockwise. I really recommend this. When you're doing a 3D problem, a lot of times it's a good idea to drop the, the concept of clockwise or counterclockwise because that is highly dependent on what perspective you're taking on the 3D system, right? Rather, the right-hand rule starts becoming your friend to define positive and negative, okay? So I'm going to say I think this should be negative, okay, because it has the effect of pushing kind of towards you at this length of 50 centimeters. That's going to have the tendency to try to pull this thing this way, right? Which would be opposite the direction that I said was the positive right-hand rule direction up here. So that component should cause a negative rotation around that z-axis. All right. What do you think we're going to find if we punch that those two values in right there. Let's see. 400 times 5 divided by, let me actually put this other one in there, 5 times 30 divided by the square root of 5 squared uh, plus 2 squared 
plus 1 squared minus 400 times 2 times 50 divided by the square root of 5 squared plus 2 squared plus 1 squared. That's what it's doing internally. Okay. Now we can show ourselves that way where we actually think of it physically and come up with what, those, what the two components are that cause that rotational effect around Z. Or you could actually look at this definition of our cross product and see that it'll be the same thing. The rotations that are caused around the K are based on what factors? Forces and directions in the X and Y are what cause the rotational effects around K, right? And it's true, you can cycle through them. The, the rotational effects around J are caused by forces and directions, right? For J, that's Y, right? So the forces and directions in the X and Z. OK. You guys don't look as excited about this as you should. This is like, this is the stuff right here. Your calculator is doing something for you, right? And you're the boss. OK. Any other questions on this? Oh, actually, there's one other thing I meant to do. How do I know what the total moment is acting around point A? That would be an interesting question if what I wanted to know was, is the pipe going to fail right there where, the, where it comes out of the wall? Right? Is it going to break? One of the interesting things might be, what's the total amount of moment that it's carrying right there at A, a where it comes out of the wall? How do I determine that? Yep. You're basically finding a resultant of the moment vector. Okay? He said, find the square root of the sum of the squares of the components of the moment vector. Right? That's exactly what you're doing, is you're finding a resultant of that moment vector. Okay? Happen to have one of those components right there. So let me take the square root of that squared plus what? 1825.7 squared. So my total moment that I'm going to end up having to react around A is 4,082.5. I'll put that right down here. M, and I'll show the magnitude of that, 4,082.5 Newton centimeters. All right. Any questions? All right. 